And you got to appreciate the time you're living in. We are here for such a time as this. That's what we're looking at in Esther chapter 6 this morning. But let's go to 1 Corinthians 10. Begin in verse 11 just to read this verse. Why do we read these stories and seem to apply them to ourselves? You know, the book of Esther is about one young Jewish girl. How does that apply to us uh, 2,500 years later? And why are we applying it so much to our time? And uh, we'll look at it here in this verse and then we'll pray. Paul says in verse 11, Now all these things happen unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. I mean, we are the church. Now, that was 2,000 years ago. You'd think, Paul, you had it wrong. The ends of your world are not come on you. You died 2,000 years ago. Well, when you think about the church age, he's part of that church age, and so are you. This is all written to the church. Amen? Do you understand that? So the ends of the world aren't 2,000 years ago. This is the last dispensation before that time comes, that when the Lord returns. We are in the church age of grace. And the ends of the world are come upon the church. We get to go up in the rapture. And that will bring on the things we're going to see in the book of Esther. Let's pray. Father, enlighten these young people that are with us this morning. We're glad they're here. Help them, Lord, to be interested in the things of God. Give them inspiration. Give them uh, alertness. And uh, not to let their minds wander. All of us, Lord. The Satan comes along anytime we get into the Word of God and tries to distract the mind and uh, to uh, try to cause us to fall asleep spiritually minded wise and help us now to keep our minds alert and understand the things that we're learning here this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're in uh, Esther chapter 6. Now, for you who are here just for today, some of you young people, it's a picture of a young woman who was a Jewish woman, a slave, and she was exalted to be the queen with King Ahaz, your Eris, and he was king over all the earth under the Median Persian kingdom. And it's a picture of Israel, in one hand, going through the tribulation. They're going to be persecuted here, and God's going to deliver them on one hand. So that's a Doctrinally, it's a picture of the Jews. Purim is a reminder that there's going to be a tribulation in the future for the Jewish people. And God will deliver the Jews out of their troubles, as he promised. Somebody gave me a, a pamphlet from this group called the Preterists. Brother Dave, he has a friend who's a Preterist. Preterism, anybody ever heard of Preterism? I thought it was dead and gone a long time ago. Still people believe in that stuff. But it, what it is, is it teaches that all the prophecies that Christ spoke about have come to pass in 70 A.D. when Jerusalem was destroyed. So Jesus already returned. And we are already triumphantly reigning on earth with Christ. Did you know that? Didn't you know that? We're already, the world's a wonderful place. It's going to get better and better and better. Except for the last 2,000 years. <laughs> it's just not gotten better. Yeah, he's reigning spiritually. You know who else came up with that? Ellen White, because there was a guy named uh, Smith, the Miller, Miller, Millerites they were called. And he claimed that Christ was coming in 1828, and he didn't come. He said, well, I got the dates wrong. He's coming in 1832 or whatever, and he didn't. They all got in white robes, went up on a mountain up in New York, and they all waited all day for Jesus. He didn't come. So they all got disillusioned. He said, I'm, I'm, I was wrong. I'm debunking it. And Ellen White, one of his followers, picked up his teaching and became the Seventh-day Adventists, if you want to know who they are. So she said that Jesus did come. He just came into the universe, and he's reigning now. He's in the temple, and it's a spiritual second coming. And uh, no, when Christ comes, it says, every eye shall see him. Amen? Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. When, tri when Christ comes, there'll be no mistaking it. There'll be no he entered in, and so only Ellen White knew about it. No, uh, it's going to be a visible return. And preterists teach, oh, it's already all happened. Jesus said there be some standing here who shall not taste the death till you see the Lord coming in his glory. And they said, see, uh, they saw him come in his glory already. No, if you read that chapter, it's in Matthew. Two of those men 
were able to go up on the mountain, three of them actually, went up on the mountain and saw Jesus shine in his glory. So if you want to study that out, it's in Matthew 16, the last verses, and chapter 17. So the Lord did not come back in 70 A.D. Or, uh, here was John. When did John, write the gospel? Uh, when did John write the book of Revelation? Who can tell me? Anybody have a... Raise your hand. Somebody knows. Yeah, the date. When, when, they say, when is the date of the, gospel, uh, the book of Revelation? 90, 96 A.D.? That's 20, 26 years later after Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed. How would John be writing up future events if, if it already was fulfilled? What nonsense. And they, what they didn't do is say, well, John wrote it much earlier, sometime in the 60s. Not possible. Paul was still writing the epistles. That book is the last book of the Bible, Revelation. And it capstone of the whole Bible. And it says, curses anyone that addeth to the, you know, the things that are written in this book. So it closes out the Bible, the book of Revelation. So there's a lot of false teachings out there, young people. Preterism. There's people still believing that. That's the type of amillennialism. What do you mean by amillennialism? Well, millennial means a thousand years. Now, how long will Christ reign on the earth, Brother Samuel? Do you know? A thousand years on earth. That's called the millennium. That's future. And so what is that a picture of? How many days did the Lord create the earth? You know that one, though, right? Six days, right. From Adam till now is approximately how many years, Brother Bob? About 6,000 years. And what did the Lord do on the seventh day? He rested. The earth is going to have a thousand year rest. As one day is as what? A thousand years with the Lord. So a thousand years is as one day. There's God's perfect, amen? So that's why we still celebrate, a, we go a week, no matter where you live in the world. Everybody's on a week standard. Why don't some people in China live on 10 days? Why, don't, why isn't a week four days? Ever, I mean, don't people think? Amen? Why are we living in 2023? Christ was born. There's so many obvious things right in front of people's faces. Anno Domini, the year of our Lord, A.D. We're in 2023 A.D., and yet atheists have to go by that. Boy, that must grind them, right? That must really bother the atheists. Seven days in a week. Where did that all come from? So the Lord is perfect. Esther chapter 6. On that night, verse 1, could not the king sleep? Isn't that beautiful, the, king, the English? It, put, it puts the words backward, and it's still perfect. Amen. The English language is very rich. Shakespeare proved that. And so he says, on that night could not the king sleep. Uh, so, you know, the new versions will say, oh, that's just not, we have to put the king could not sleep. No, it, just leave it alone. Learn a little bit of English. Stretch your imagination. You know what you're doing when you're reading the King James Bible? You're elevating yourself. You're learning. You're, in, you're increasing in knowledge and, and you're expanding your mind. Amen. The Lord wants you to come up higher to his level. He doesn't want you to bring the word of God down to the gutter. He says, no, come up out of humanity and learn of me. Learn to stretch your mind. On that night, could not the king sleep? And uh, here's a, a glimpse of what God's going to do. He's, he's working. Sometimes sleeplessness is needful. And sometimes when you have a sleepless night, you might get on your knees and pray for somebody. Or you might open the Bible. That's what he did. He opened up the Chronicles. <laughs> you know, there's two books in the Bible called Chronicles. And he commanded to bring the book. I find that interesting. The Bible's always called the book. The book. I'm, I'm a man of one book. Amen? This is the book. And the king, what's he going to do? Open the book. And he bring the book of records of the Chronicles. And they were read before the king. So every king had ledgers and history even in the bible the king was commanded to copy the law of god by his, his own hand that was a that was one of his tasks as king he was supposed to take the law of god and write it out word for word i mean I, i've seen a guy who did that once i watched him on youtube he did it with higher what do you call that that not hieroglyphics but that calligrapha and it took him a long time. Can you imagine taking every word in his Bible, starting from the beginning and writing it out, not just reading the Bible? 
That would take you a long time. And uh, that's what the king was supposed to do in the Bible. And the Lord, uh, look in Daniel 7.10. Let's go to Daniel. The Lord is a God of books. He has the ledgers. He has the chronicles. He has the history. And one day he's going to open the books. You know, the Lord opens his word and looks in the book and is reminded of the things from his own word. You should open the book at night. Just say you can't sleep. Get your Bible open up. Go in there and read something. See what God will show you. The king could not sleep. I'll tell you one thing that will help you sleep. Start praying. Amen? <laughs> I'll tell you, uh, if you can pray, the Lord said, what, could you not watch one hour? If you could pray for one hour, Jesus prayed for one hour and they all fell asleep. Did you ever notice that in the Garden of Gethsemane? One hour, and the Lord came back, they were all snoring. And the Lord said, what, could you not watch one hour? You can't find anybody who can pray. I can't, that's hard to pray an hour. You'll fall asleep on your knees. Try to pray an hour. Try to pray 15 minutes. And you, you're having trouble with insomnia? Start reading your Bible. You'll fall asleep in your chair. There's nothing make you more drowsy than the devil wafting you to sleep trying to read your Bible. <laughs> I've missed many a subway station. I woke up in Coney Island, how many times, man, coming home from work trying to read my Bible and fell asleep. I, you know, last stop, <laughs> Coney Island, <laughs> I'm on the D train. Oh, I got to go back, got to cross the platform, get back home, you know. I mean, praise the Lord. Read your Bible, you'll fall asleep even in the middle of the day. Well, this is, why? It's a spiritual thing. It's hard to stay awake in church sometimes. Your mind is not apt to want to think on spiritual things. And the Bible talks about the Lord in his book here in Daniel 7. Look at verse 10. Here's a picture of the Lord in verse 9. I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the Ancient of Days did sit like Ahasuerus. He's a king whose garment was white as snow and his hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Hey, it's terrifying. When you think about the Lord and his glory, he, he's fe it's fearful. I mean, people don't understand who the Lord is. They, we make light of who he is. He's not just my buddy. You ever read in the Bible some dark things about the Lord? I will laugh at them and their calamity cometh in Proverbs 1. Proverbs 1 at the end there. Like a whirlwind, he says, I called, I, you, I rose up early and you would not. You wouldn't hear me. But you ever read that verse where he says, O daughter of Babylon, happy is he that dasheth what? Thy little ones upon the stones? Whew. Happy shall he be? Talking about the Lord. That's Psalms 137. That is the dark side of God. He says, because you wasted us in Jerusalem and you treated my apple of my eye that way, there's a day coming when I will take your little ones. That's not even a pleasant thought. And I will dash them upon the stones. He will destroy their children. That's God. You say, how could a holy God, I'm not going to question God, he's holy and his wrath will come upon the heads of those who despised him and their children, little ones. There's some dark passages in the Bible, amen? And the, this is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Knowing therefore, even for the Christian, knowing, as preacher preached a week ago, knowing therefore the what? Terror of the Lord. We should have a healthy terror and a reverence for the Lord. And the king has all power. And I beheld because of the voice, verse 11, I beheld because of the voice. What was open? Wait, I missed the verse at the end there. The judgment was set and the books were opened. You have a book too. There's going to be a book. All of your life is in the book after you've been saved. Before you were saved, it's a blank. It's clean. Amen? Your sins are gone. But the Bible says we'll be judged for what we do since we've been saved in our bodies. You got a book. And there's books, and the king keeps the books. Look in Revelation. Revelation 20, verse 12. The Lord is ty typifying himself through Ahasuerus. He's a God that loves books. He doesn't like internet. He doesn't like television. God doesn't like social media. He likes books. Amen. How do I know? It's in the book. God has a book. Amen? And he, there's going to be a book till he comes. And there's going to be books after he comes. He's going to open books in heaven. He's not going to open up his app. 
Praise God. There's going to be none of this man-made junk. There, you know, there's going to be books in heaven. You know what else is going to be in heaven? Horses. There's a horse. Jesus Christ sitting on a horse. There's going to be books in heaven. Holy books. So what are they made? I don't know. Maybe golden sheets of paper. I don't know what the Lord. He, I, I love Bibles, don't you? My wife's looking at a Bible from, where's those buds? S-C-H-Y-L-E-R. Oh, wait, S-C-H-U. Y-L-E-R, Schuyler. About $200 for the Bible. That's not too much, actually, for a Bible nowadays. And you look at some Bibles, $400. But it's got blue covered with gold leaf. You ever seen that? When you turn the page, it's blue. But when it's shut, it's gold. It has a, it's really nice. So uh, my son's nice Bible over there. It's got, what, lambskin on it? Uh, about $150 Bible. You can't hardly get a good Bible nowadays for less than $150. Bucks. But it's a good investment. I mean, you'll spend how much on a gun or a car? A Bible's the best investment you'll ever buy. You'll never get more for your mileage. You'll never get anything better than having a Bible that you pay money for. You, that's something that does not depreciate. Amen. You, it just gets more dividends as you go. So the Lord said he's gonna, he loves books. You ought to love books. You know, what's, you know what's a deficit today? Readers. We used to say uh, readers are leaders. The pen is mightier than the sword. People used to read a lot. People used to write a lot. We don't have those minds anymore that people can uh, use their imaginations. Even lost men had great imagination. You know, Mark Twain and, and Lew Robert Louis Stevenson and all those, you know, Edgar Burroughs, Rice Burroughs, all those old-time authors and Shakespeare, where are they today? People have been destroyed by TV and movies. They're not able to use their imagination. You can't captivate people with illustrations hardly anymore. The Bible, reading these things, their mind wanders away because you've got to have sis boom ba explosions and gunshots and drama and music that mounts as it gets closer to the door opening, you know. You're led by, you don't even realize how much music plays a part in you with mu mu manipulating your mind. People are easily, like Pavlov's dog, manipulated with visual aid and musical aid and everything to get you to stay focused on it. It's hard to compete with that, with young people today. Hard to compete to get them in church, to listen to the Word of God and keep your attention. Look in Revelation, look at chapter 20, and look at verse 12. Revelation 20, look at verse 12. The Lord is a God of books. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened and another book was opened which is the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works there's going to be a lot of books we've seen in Daniel 7 Revelation 20 God is a bookkeeper he's a king kings always kept books and so here we go back to Esther chapter 6 and he couldn't sleep so he got the book out and uh, he read in, it, in verse 2 and, uh, and they read from the record of the Chronicles, verse 1, and they were read before the king, and it was found written that Mordecai had told of Bigthana and Teresh, two of the keepers of the door who sought to lay hand on the king Ahasuerus. They wanted to have an assassination attempt. Now, people today would call Mordecai a snitch or a stool pigeon or a fink. You know, you ever notice how all the bad names are given to somebody who tells the truth by all these criminals? <laughs> you know, all the, all the guys in prison, all the mafia guys, they got names for them. You know, a squealer, a snitch, a tattletale. They try to put that on kids at school. Oh, never tell the authorities what's going on. Don't snitch on your friend. Mordecai did. He said, these two guys are going to try to kill the king. He went and get, opened up the, uh, the matter to those that are in authority. Hey, it's not wrong to tell the truth. If you see something wrong at work, you see something. That people try to make you fearful to tell the truth. Well, you know, hey, you scratch your back and you cover this up, I'll help you in due time. So, uh, you know, hey, I don't want to be the guy to be the bearer of bad news and be a snitch. You notice how all those names make you feel bad? Squealer, snitch, tattletale, uh, stool pigeon, a fink, a rat. You know, they call you a rat in prison, right? I'm no rat. Yeah, you are. You're a murdering man. <laughs> No, the, you know, prostitution, all those mafia guys. I may be a murderer, but I'm no rat. <laughs> you know? Isn't that funny? Like, I, I'm true to the cause. I'm loyal to the mafia. I'm not going to turn on them. I'll never do that. And that's how the, the, the world thinks, too. 
I'm a Catholic, and I'm going to die a Catholic. I'm going to be loyal till death. It would be a sin against God if I ever left the Catholic Church. I'm a Buddhist. I'm a Muslim. I'm a, I am going to be true to the end. doesn't matter if it's right or wrong. That's how the devil gets people. Mordecai, he was a truth teller even if he knew he would die for it. That guy, Haman, hated Mordecai. He hated Mordecai because he was telling the truth. He wouldn't bow down to him. He wouldn't do it the world's way. He said, I'm going to be a straight shooter. I'm going to tell the truth. And, he, and you know what? God saw that. In due time, he got rewarded. Now, already there's been a death warrant put out against him and all his people because of his telling the truth. Because he told the truth, not only has that man already got a death warrant signed against Mordecai, but against all of his people, the Jews. It may cost you, and it might cost God's people to tell the truth. Martin Luther stood up against the Pope of Rome, amen? And he started a reformation because he posted on the door of Wittenberg Church the 95 Thesis, or maybe 96, but I think it's 95, right? <laughs> Can't get them numbers. The 95 Thesis against indulgences. And the Pope wrote a bull against him and said, we're going to burn Luther at the stake. We're going to kill him. He's condemned. And, the, and Martin Luther said, um, I wrote a bull against the Pope of Rome. <laughs> he said, I, can, I oust the Pope and all, the, all the, the Catholics from the Church of God. He was bold. He was not afraid to die. He was not afraid to, to, to tell the truth. Christian, don't be afraid to tell the truth. It may cost you promotion. It was costing Mordecai his life. It cost Christians their life in the dark ages. It's costing some Christians right now in Africa, Indonesia, China, other places in the Middle East, their lives to tell the truth. The least we can do is not be ashamed to have somebody mock you at work. Amen? Well, what's going to happen to you if you tell, tell the truth about Jesus Christ? People might laugh at you. I mean, what's the worst scenario we could suffer here in America right now for being a Christian? Somebody got an idea? Give me what might happen. Dina, stop hanging out with you. You lose some friends, amen? What are some more things that might happen if you tell the truth and be a Christian? Anybody got something? You might lose your job. They say, no, we, you got to be here on Sunday. And, and you say, well, that's real, real, that's the day's, day of the Lord, I, you know. I've got to be in church. You might lose a job. You might lose friends. You might have people uh, speak about you behind your back. Right? You'll feel it. If you do right, you're going to suffer as a Christian. You can't avoid it. In some way, you will. And so what is happening here? Let's go back to Esther chapter 6. We've got a little time. And it was found written that Mordecai had told the truth of Bigtha and Teresh, two of the king's chamberlains, the keepers of the door, who sought to lay hands on the king Ahasuerus. And the king said, What honor and dignity hath been done to Mordecai for this? Then said the king's servants that minister unto him, There is nothing done for him. You know, sometimes you do right, and you just never get rewarded. That's fine. Mordecai didn't say, Hey, what about me? You know, the Lord had a plan. Don't worry about getting your rewards down here either. Amen? You might get rewarded. The Lord may give you your due right now. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. Look at chapter 5, verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you when? In due time. You don't know when that time is due. And you mothers, you have, have had babies. There's a time, there's a due, when you due date, right? They call it the due date. <laughs> About nine months. But you don't know when that baby's going to come exactly, do you? <laughs> but I tell you, you know it's coming. <laughs> and if you do right, you can be assured that God's day of reward will come. In due time. Not your time. Not my time. In due time. In God's time. There's plenty of times in the Bible where it talks about due time. You know, God is never late. Here was Mordecai. They're going to be put to death. There's a, Haman's built the gallows in chapter 5. Everything's against this guy. But the king couldn't sleep. 
Some of the commentators say this or that of why he couldn't sleep. You know why he couldn't sleep? Who knows why he couldn't sleep? Why? Is there something behind why God wouldn't let him sleep? What were they doing back in chapter 5? They were fasting for three days and praying. You see, that's the power of, of the Christian life. That king, there was something behind his insomnia. There was something moving behind the scenes that the king would say, I want to see what's in the Chronicles. Read me the book. God was listening to somebody praying and fasting. And God says, hey, I hear your prayers, and I'm going to move when it, just at the right time. The midnight hour, the Lord comes through just in time. Because in the next verse, just as the king's saying those words, who am I going to reward? Who am I going to bless? In comes Haman in chapter 6, verse 4. <laughs> and he's coming in to curse Mordecai, but it's too late. The Lord got there first. Remember when Jacob and Esau went in to Isaac? Isn't that neat how the Lord, just at the right time, does something in your life? How many of you have had that happen where you needed the Lord and just he brought you to the brink and then he showed his power? Isn't that marvelous? I've seen it happen so many times where I needed God to help me with money or I needed God to, to answer a prayer with sickness, medication needed to get in to somebody's baby just at the right time and they got the medication through prayer. What was I going to say? Um... People were praying three days. Um, it's a, and so uh, what was I going to say? The king, uh, due time. Let's look at a few verses on due time. Romans 5, 6. Romans chapter 5. The Lord is never late. You might think he's late. You may not like his timing. But God's timing is perfect. Our timing may not be. We may do things wrong time-wise. But I'll tell you what, if you're faithful like Mordecai, you're faithful like, oh, I wanted to say Jacob and Esau. We'll go back and read that verse. It's appropriate. But let's look at due time. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. He waited 4,000 years to come. But it was the right time. It was the fourth day in, in God's chart. The fourth day, the sun came up in the fourth day. There's a way the Lord works. Christ came, you know, say, why didn't he come? Why didn't God fix things way back there in the garden? He had a plan, and his plan was to give the law and show men that the law cannot save. And then Christ came at the right time, born of a virgin, made under the law in due time. Look in uh, Galatians chapter 4. Galatians 4. Galatians chapter 4. Look at verse 4. But when the fullness of the time was come, God has a, like a, a sand hour clock, you know? And he's patient. And it might go a long time. That sand may fall, but God says, okay, now is the time. And you may be going through a trial, and God may be putting you through something, and he's not going to let you out until he says the time is full. The Lord has a a time for you. He has a plan for you. And you've got to go through your stages. You've got to go through your lesson. You can't just go to 12th grade. You've got to go through first grade, second grade, third grade. You can't just run the home base from home base. You've got to go to first plate, then second base. Amen? Then we have a softball team. It'd be nice if you could just hit the ball and say, I'm home. Why run around the bases? We've got to do your paces. You've got to go through your lessons in life. And there's time when God will work in your heart, and you've got to go through the time. You've got to go through that trial and learn to be humble in due time. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due time. His time. And it says here, when Christ came, he says, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. It's been 2,000 years since Christ ascended into heaven. Ten more years will be 2,000 years since 33 A.D. The Lord is very patient. 
Many have said, Lord, why haven't you come back yet? Lord, we're going through so much suffering. How long, Lord? How long? The Lord says, my time is not yet fulfilled. I have a plan. I have a clock. My clock isn't like your clock. Amen? Payday will come in due time. Mordecai was waiting on the Lord. He trusted in the Lord. Look at another one, Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. Maybe you're impatient and you're saying, Lord, I don't understand why I've been going through this for so long. God has a, a time. Paul says it here in Titus chapter 1, verse 3. Uh, look at verse 2. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. That's something he said a long time ago. He promised. Man, God made a promise, and it took 4,000 years to fulfill but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. Go back to Genesis with me, to Jacob and Esau. Look in Genesis 27. You've got to be vigilant too, though, because you could miss the time. <laughs> you could miss the opportunity. Remember the... Ten virgins in, in, uh, Re in uh, Matthew 25. Five were ready and five were not. And uh, five had to go out and buy oil. And when they went out, the bridegroom came. And they were not ready. And they missed their opportunity. You know, Mordecai was praying. He was fasting. He was vigilant. He was humble. And he was waiting on the Lord. Esther did the same thing. And the king held forth the scepter. She waited and fasted and said, you know, if, if I perish, I perish. I'm ready when the Lord opens the door. Be faithful, be patient. And here, uh, Genesis 27, uh, here's a guy who was rash. He was not patient. Esau. Esau was a guy who said, hey, what good is this birthright to me? I'm going to die. Give me your food. Give me that pottage. I need to eat it right now or I'm going to die. I don't think so. He wasn't going to die. He was, he was dramatic, very dramatic. Oh, I'm so hungry. If he was so hungry, he would have been laying on the ground, you know, dying, and Jacob would have took care of his brother and he would have fed him. <laughs> you know, he's like, oh, I'm so hungry. Here, take my birthright. He goes, what do you got? You got some money? Nah, what about your birthright? Jacob was thinking. He's a man looking for opportunity. Waiting for opportunity, waiting on the Lord. So here, look in Genesis 27. His mother saw that too, and she helped him. Genesis 27, verse 30. I, I couldn't help but think about these two boys whenever Mordecai and Haman. And it came to pass as soon as Isaac had made an end of blessing Jacob. As soon, as soon, as soon as. What happens? And Jacob was yet scarce gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father. He just went through the tent door. What happens? That Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. Man, God has ways of just getting you out of a trouble or getting you a blessing. His time is perfect. Go back to Esther. God, go wor work out every detail if you'll trust him. Trust in the Lord. I can't tell you how many times God helped me with putting something in my life. Traveling down the highways and people helped us out. Uh, paying bills, people gave a love offering. Just every step of the way, if you just wait, trust in the Lord. I can't tell you how many times I've been so blessed, the hath have not been told <laughs> of how good God's been to me, Ed Keo. I'm a wretched sinner. I don't deserve a thing. But man, God has just loaded me up with a good wife and good boys and so much blessings I can't even, I don't deserve it. You don't deserve it either. If the truth be told, you could say the same thing. Amen. You ought to thank the Lord this morning for his timing it, in due time. And it says, and it was uh, verse 3, and the king said, What honor and dignity hath been done to Mordecai for this? And then and the, the king's servants that then said the king's servants that minister on him, there is nothing done for him. Time. All this time passed. And you know, you might get mad that, oh, why does this person get recognition? Why does that person get blessed? Just be like David. He was out there in the wilderness running around for years. 
His wife mocked him and said, oh, how vaingloriously was the king today. She was a daughter of Saul, very jealous for Saul. She didn't know God chose David, and she never had a child. Saul threw spears at him. Here he was, God's chosen already, anointed by Samuel. He went out against Goliath, and his brothers hated him, said, oh, we know the naughtiness of your heart. How, man, how terrible that must feel, right? You came down to see the war. We know you. His older brother, what was his name, Nathan? And he mocked David. And David went out and killed Goliath anyway. Here was Saul, and David had a chance to put him to death. Remember that? And one of his men said, take him. The Lord, he's in your hand. The Lord gave him into your hand. And what did David say? I will not touch the Lord's anointed. And God said, and he said, wait. And the David said, I'll wait until the Lord exalts me. I'll stay humble. And God exalted David. And even when David fell with Bathsheba and killed Uriah, the Lord gave him mercy because he remembered those times. And it kind of was on his credit. That's a good thing to have some credit with the Lord, amen? That when you do fall, remember that if you do fall, they will receive you into everlasting habitations. I don't know how to doctrinally put that all together, but... The Bible says that make friends with the commandment of unrighteousness. For when you, f- when you fail, they shall receive you into everlasting habitation. It's kind of like saying, lay up in store against the day of wrath. Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Put up some good credit with God. Because there's going to be days when you will stumble and fall. And God will say, I still love you and I know, what you, I know why that happened. But in due time, God will provide. His name is what? Jehovah Jireh. You know what that means, Brother Nick? The Lord who provides. That's one of the names of God in the Old Testament. You're going through some stuff right now? You should be thinking, Jehovah Jireh. He's my God. No matter what I go through, God will provide what I need. Amen? Will God provide what you need? Amen. And he did right here. What happens? Interesting. He uses the enemy of Mordecai. And the king said, who was in the court? Now Haman, it's almost like Jacob just went out, you know, and Esau came in. And the king said, who was in the court? Now Haman was coming to the outward court of the king's house to speak unto the king to hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. That's what's in his heart. He's very selfish. And the king's servant said unto him, behold, Haman standeth in the court. And the king said, let him come in. Isn't this the Lord's sense of humor here? You want to see God's sense of humor? He'll use your enemies to bless you. He'll use people that are devising evil against you to exalt you (laughs) in due time. So Haman came in, and the king said unto him, What shall be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor? Now Haman thought in his heart, "Here's, here's how egotism works. To whom would the king delight to do honor more than to myself? so egotistical he thinks the king must like me more than anybody I, I like me more than anybody so the king must do watch out for, for inflated ego amen this guy gets himself hung because of his ego he thinks he's more important than anybody else he thinks too highly of himself Bible says not to think we ought not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think amen they that compare themselves among themselves are what not wise for Haman answered the king, For the man whom the king delighteth to honor, here's what I want. Let the royal apparel be brought which the king useth to wear, and the horse that the king rideth upon, and the crown royal which is set upon his head. And let this apparel and horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes, that they may array the man with all whom the king delighteth to honor, and bring him on horseback through the street of the city, and proclaim before him thus Shall it be done to the man whom the king delighteth to honor? (laughs) Then the king said to Haman, Make haste, and take the apparel and the horse, as thou hast said, and do even so to Mordecai the Jew, that sitteth at the king's gate. Let nothing fail of all that thou hast spoken. He calls him Mordecai the Jew. You know why he calls him the... you You know what the king doesn't know? He doesn't know that he signed a decree to kill Mordecai. Look, look at the sneaky way. Go back to chapter 3, verse 8. Then look at 8 and 9. Look how Haman phrased it. 
And Haman said unto the king Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people. He didn't say they were Jews. King Ahasuerus doesn't know his own wife is condemned. He doesn't have a clue. He's kind of, you know, it's a sad thing. Sometimes the he that wears the crown or those that are in charge don't know what's going on around him a lot of times. And they're kept in the dark. That's the case right there. He doesn't know his own wife has been condemned to, put, to be put to death by his own hand. He doesn't know this man he wants to honor has already been decree signed to put him to death on a certain month on a certain day. And it says, uh, scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom, and their laws are diverse from all people. Neither keep they the king's laws, therefore it is not for them the king's prophet to suffer them. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hand of those that have the charge of the business to bring it into the king's treasuries. The king never had heard yet that it was the Jewish people that he signed to put to death. So when he says here, I want to exalt this guy Mordecai, he's a Jew. He doesn't know that he's going to be put to death by his own hand. And so um, here we see God's sense of humor in the sense of timing. He saw that that guy was coming, and he knew he, what he would say. And, he, and by his own mouth, now he's got to watch Mordecai set on that horse, put on the royal apparel, put the crown on his head. And he's got to lead Mordecai, the man he hates, around the street, saying, Thus shall it be done unto the man. Who is that humbling? Man, does God know how to humble, amen? If that isn't the epitome of being humbled to the, to the max and exalted to the max in due time. And it says, what does he tell me? And uh, then took Haman the apparel and the horse, verse 11, and arrayed Mordecai and brought, he had to put those clothes on him and serve him. That's a picture of the enemies of God one day are going to bow down to Israel. They're going to array Israel. They're going to put a crown on the head of Israel in the millennium. All the Palestinians, all the Arabs, <laughs> All the nations are going to come and they're going to have to bow down to Israel, the bride of God. And they're, they're going to sit upon thrones. With, that's Mordecai the Jew. That's what this is about. Take heed what you do unto the Jew. Amen. The Bible says, I will bless them that bless thee and thy seed after thee. You better bless the seed of Israel. Amen. Because that's, that's who God wants to exalt. And brought him on horseback through the street of the city and proclaimed before him, Thus shall it be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor. You know, Satan's going to go after Israel, and he's going to be cast down to the earth, and he's going to be destroyed by his own imaginations. God's going to, you know what the Lord's going to do just at the end there, just at the right time? He's going to resurrect all of the Jews, and they're going to come back with Jesus Christ, and they're going to smite Satan and his armies. Those people that the devil's going to go and try to destroy in the tribulation. He's going to exalt them with him on the throne. They're going to come back with Jesus Christ and us in the rapture, two armies, and they're going to come up the king's highway and go up into the valley of Megiddo and destroy Satan and all his armies. That's what happens here. And the devil's going to have to bow the knee. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Satan's going to get on his knee in the end and bow down to Jesus Christ. And he's going to have to exalt God and the Jews. And Mordecai came again to the king's gate, but Haman hasted. Twice you see the word haste. This guy's in a hurry now to get out. He wants to get out. You ever, when we're street preaching and people are there trying to rev their engines, you ought to watch it sometimes. Man, they fly up the block, man, as fast as they can get out of there. They make haste, man. They can't stand the word of God so bad. Right, Bob? Yeah, I've never seen anybody. And the cops sometimes are right behind them, and they put the lights on, and they get them by the time they get down the block. I've seen that out maybe twice already. There, there, there. And the, and the cops are on our side, and they're out there. And then they're, they're trying to blow smoke all over us, and they just can't stand the Bible, and they can't stand us preaching. And then they fly out, man, 60 miles an hour up to that light, that path across there. And the cops' lights go on. And just, oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> I can't help. I know I shouldn't think that in my heart. <laughs> but I do. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, get him, Lord. <laughs> you know why I say that? Because the Lord's humbling that guy. Maybe he'll get saved. Maybe he'll think, put two and two together. 
I just mocked the preacher and now I'm getting the ticket. Maybe God's on their side. Haman didn't think about that. Haman didn't stop and say, you know what? I was wrong. I'm going to tear down these gallows. I'm going to go to the king and tell him I'm out against these Jews. The king wants to bless the Jews. Even his family recognized that. Look how it ends here. We're good spent. And Haman told Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends everything that had befallen him. Then said his wise men and Zeresh, his wife, unto him, If Mordecai be of the seed of the Jews before whom thou hast begun to fall, thou shalt not prevail against him, but thou shalt surely fall before him. <laughs> you know what he needed to do right at that moment? One word. Who got the word? Who knows the word? What should he have done right there? Repent. He should have just said, I'm wrong. I'm going to repent. This is dumb. I am just full of pride. I am so egotistically, it's all got to be my way. I couldn't stand when I saw that man not bowing down to me, but I, he doesn't have to bow down to me. Who am I? I'm nobody. And while they were yet talking with him, came the king's chamberlains and hasted three times, hasted to bring Haman unto the banquet that Esther had prepared. Uh, I guess that word haste is because it's even so uh, quickly, the Lord, even uh, come quickly, Lord Jesus. The Lord's going to come quickly. This stuff's going to happen fast. Seven years, three and a half years. Satan's going to fall to the earth. It's all going to happen quick. Whenever God puts the Jew and exalts them and brings Satan down, it's going to happen in a very quick, hasty time. And so we saw in this chapter the beginnings of God bringing the Jew to prominence and bringing the Antichrist and his kingdom to an end. Haman is a picture of the Antichrist. Haman is a picture of who one who hates God's people. And so this chapter, what we read in the beginning was, the ends of the world are come upon us. We're seeing this stuff come to play with Israel becoming a nation, 1942, I mean 1948, and watching the, this nation grow and God preparing the ten kings of Europe. What's going on in Russia is drawing the kings of Europe together. It's not all about Ukraine. God's plan in due time. He said there needs to be a king, ten kings that are going to join their powers and give their power to the Antichrist. That's coming out of the Roman Empire of Europe. And we're seeing it come to pass quickly in our day. Quickly, after 2,000 years, whew, things are happening real quick. So hang on. The Lord's coming soon. Amen. Let's pray.